Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Dale Hudson, and I'm moderating today's talk, which is Nadia Koop's lecture, um, Redefi I'm sorry, Defining Alternative Arab Cinema of the 1970s and 1980s. Um, Nadia Koop is here at NYU Abu Dhabi as a senior research fellow in the Humanities Research Fellowship for the Study of the Arab World. And she is also a professor at the Department of Asians and Middle East Studies at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, she's the author of a few books, including Pens, Swords, and the, Springs, and the Springs of Art, The Oral Poetry of Dueling in Weddings in Galilee from Brill, nine, and, sorry, 2006, Palestinian Cinema in the Days of Revolution from University of Texas Press, 2018, and numerous articles and book chapters on Arab film and literature. She's also the co-editor of Bad Girls of the Arab World from University of Texas Press, 2017. And her current research project um, also includes an edited volume on visual representations of the Gaza Strip titled Gaza on Screen. Um, so I'm going to welcome her and then just to let you know that um, we will be having a Q&A after her talk. The talk will be about 30, 40 minutes and then we'll have about 20 minutes for um, questions and answers. And if you could put your questions in the Q&A um, tool, not in the chat, that would be really helpful. And then I will read them out and Nadia will respond. Great, thank you, Dale. Um, and, uh, and particularly, thank you for, for taking on the task of moderating uh, during NYU's fall break. <laughs> That's very generous. And I'd also like to thank um, Alexandra Sandu for organizing this. Um, uh, it's always really helpful to have a chance to present one's work as a, as a way of um, sort of organizing one's thoughts. So I really appreciate that at the start of this project. Um, and uh, so the quick caveat before I begin, uh, and let me turn on my PowerPoint before I forget, um, is that uh, this very much is a work in progress. And uh, um, so um, I really appreciate any feedback that you have um, uh, either through the Q&A or you know, just email me um, after the fact. Um, uh, okay, so my talk is gonna be structured around the um, the 1972 Young Filmmakers Festival that took place in Damascus, um, that is uh, sort of seen as the beginning of alternative Arab cinema. Um, in that, the, that's where the, the term was coined. Um, but I want to begin by talking about the announcement um, that was made for this talk, where I chose to use an image. Um, the poster from uh, um, Taufik Saleh's films, The Dupes. So I chose to illustrate the talk with this poster um, because the film is widely regarded as Saleh's masterpiece and a gem of Arab cinema. As a realist, politically engaged and conspicuously transnational work directed by an Egyptian filmmaker, funded and produced within the Syrian public sector film industry and telling a transnational, historically informed Arab story, the dupes in many ways exemplifies the type of cinema that the, the Damascus, Damascus gathering called for. Indeed, the film which had just been completed uh, screened at the festival and was widely acclaimed by its att attendees. Tawfiq Saleh was not a young filmmaker though, and although he was in Damascus at the time, he did not participate in the festival. In fact, as a member of the first wave of Egyptian realist filmmakers that had emerged in the 1960s from Gamal Abdel Nasser's support for Egyptian public sector cinema, he was skeptical of the project and doubted its necessity. Staunchly committed to social justice and the needs of the oppressed, Saleh was stymied throughout his career by limited resources and censorship and came to Syria in 1970 when all possibilities for filmmaking in Egypt were closed to him. Financial exigencies and disappointment with the politics of filmmaking drove him from Syria to Iraq, where he unhappily taught filmmaking and directed his last film, The Now Lost, The Long Days, based on the life of Saddam Hussein, before eventually returning to Egypt in the mid 1980s. Indeed, most of Saleh's films are either lost or otherwise unavailable, and the digitized versions of the dupes circulating today are from a poor quality, unrestored print. 
Saleh's perspective and career illustrates many key fe features of alternative Arab cinema, including the unevenness of its historical development across the Arab world, the peripatetic nature of the work of its most committed practitioners, and the fuzziness of the borders defining which words belong in the category. Most importantly, it illustrates the cinema's embeddedness in politics, even when the works themselves are not overtly political, and the tenacity of its practitioners in the face of repeated setbacks. This is the cinema of filmmakers whose economic and political constraints severely limited the number of films they could make. It is a cinema that, at the time, hardly circulated in the Arab world itself, even though Arab viewers were these filmmakers' foremost addressees. These were film writers who repeatedly tried to establish Arab film, film journals only to see them shut down by censors. Participants sold their family land to make films and incurred debt to publish their writings. They wrote and made films while working other jobs, sometimes within the very cultural institutions that threw up roadblocks to their projects or as producers on American films shot in the Arab world that continued to dominate Arab, sprints, Arab screens. In April, 1972, the General Cinema Organization in Syria hosted the first international festival for young filmmakers in Damascus. Quote, filmmakers flocked to the festival, some carrying their first long narrative films and others brought short films, mostly documentaries, a third group brought only ideas for a new cinema and projects for films they hoped to realize one day, Jordanian filmmaker Adnan Madanat recalls. The festival and its symposia on Palestinian and alternative Arab cinema inspired two special journal issues, one in the Syrian cultural publication Al Ma'arifa and the other in At Tariq, the journal of the Lebanese Communist Party, and considerable press coverage in periodicals across the Arab world. Although the festival itself never recurred, when the Biennial Damascus International Film Festival began in 1979, it was a very different type of event. The Young Filmmakers Festival was widely hailed as something, the beginning of something new in the region, the start of a film movement that would transform all aspects of cinema in the Arab world. What emerged was something far less defined, a stream of events, gatherings, writings, and films that were loosely connected in terms of scope and mission and that never manifested in lasting institutions, but that nonetheless helped to shape the development of Arab cinema in the ensuing decades. In my larger research project, I trace the history of this cinema from the 1972 Damascus gathering through the reassessment of alternative Arab cinema by several of its participants in the second issue of at -Tariq, devoted to the subject in 1988. This period, which roughly corresponds at one end with the 1967 Arab defeat and the global student uprisings of 1968 that also shook the Arab world, and at the other by the collapse of the Soviet Union and its effects on the global left. My project revisits this uh, cinema history through a transnational lens in an attempt to capture the constraints, failures, and disappointments that define cinema of this period, but also the dynamism, dedication, and enthusiasm of its participants as they engaged in intense discussions about film theory and filmmaking and worked through repeated setbacks to produce something new in the region. In my talk today, I will briefly set the stage for this history by describing the cinema landscape of the Arab world in which the participants at the Damascus gathering sought to intervene and the conditions that would shape their thinking and practice. In the decades leading up to the beginnings of alternative Arab cinema, the Arab world enjoyed a well-established and rich cinema culture rooted in the commercial productions from Egypt and as well as the United States, France, and India. Cinema had first come to the Arab world soon after its invention. The Lumiere brothers and others shot and screened footage in Egypt, North Africa, and greater Syria in the late 19th century. And movie theaters opened in the 1900s in Cairo, Alexandria, Tunis, Algiers, Oran, and a few years later in Damascus, Aleppo, and Beirut. By the 1920s, Arabs were making their own films in Egypt, Tunisia, Syria, and Lebanon, 
and Studio Misser, the first successful film studio, was founded in 1934-35 in Egypt, where a robust film viewing culture had already developed. Studio Misser and others that arose in its wake quickly developed a highly productive cinema culture that was similar to Hollywood's in its emphasis on profit and entertainment, its reliance on proven film genres, and its deployment of film star power. In areas controlled by France, Syria, Mount Lebanon, and North Africa, west of Libya, in the pre-independence era, cinema, cinema was both widespread and tightly controlled. The French limited local Arab production while exploiting the region for its own Orientalist films. At the same time, they established scene clubs as part of their civilizing mission and made extensive use of cinema caravans to screen pedagogical and propaganda films to local audiences across their colonies. Thus, in the mid 20th century, when much of the Arab world achieved independence from colonial powers, the region enjoyed a rich film culture Commercial cinemas proliferated, not just in major cities, but also in small towns and catered to a diverse audience. Film clubs offered viewers opportunities to see and discuss a variety of imported films, as did occasional local film festivals. Even in Palestinian refugee camps, UNRWA provided weekly screenings of Egyptian films through mobile cinema units. Film viewing then was a well-rooted and beloved leisure activity. While many parts of the Arab world boasted healthy cinema audiences, Arab cinema production outside of Egypt and to some extent Lebanon was sporadic until the 1960s. At the same time, the importance of film as a medium and cinema as an art form was widely recognized around the world. In the mid 20th century, it was understood that the development of independent media, including film was a necessary part of the process of creating modern functioning nations from formerly colonized lands. In 1962, for instance, the United Nations General Assembly <coughs> adopted a resolution expressing a need to address the unequal distribution of knowledge and media circuits around the globe. And this would be a major product project of the UN um, well into the, uh, the 1980s um, through the, the call for a new world information order. Throughout the 1960s, UNESCO hosted roundtables on theater, cinema, literature, and plastic arts in, Arab, in the Arab world in Asia as a means of encouraging development in these areas within each nation state and pan-continental collaborations. Individual Arab states were eager to develop their film industries, and UNESCO included the encouragement of quality Arab cinema and television among its activities in 1960s. A series of roundtables on Arab cinema and culture um, were held in Beirut to discuss ways for improving the quality of films made in the region, building committed and educated film audiences, raising the profile of Arab cinema internationally, promoting awareness of Arab culture and scientific achievements, and establishing and sustaining East-West cultural connections and exchanges. exchanges. UNESCO also supported the creation of the Inter-Arab Cinema Cinematographic Center in Beirut, which worked to promote the development of cinema as a, as a recognized local art form that appealed to Arab mass audiences, while simultaneously recognizing the development of well-formed and content-rich films. Cinema had been a propaganda tool of colonial powers and a commercial enterprise in Egypt in the pre-independence period. It was now to be reconfigured as a tool for the development of the type of local but modern, quote, quality culture that would contribute to the sense of Arab and or local national identity that was deemed a necessary component for the success of independent Arab states. And this ethos uh, continues to inform the work of these the filmmakers um, that gathered in Damascus um, and beyond. Arab cinema and cultural roundtable recommendations were studiously apolitical from this period, with polite recommendations concerning the modifications of censorship procedures, constituting the extent to which participants in the forums were willing to address politics in the region. But beginning in the late 50s, there had already been a growing awareness in the region of other more militant roles for cinema, 
Ironically, it may have been the use France made of film for propaganda purposes in parts of the Arab world that it controlled that first gave rise to overtly political cinema in the region. In Algeria, the first militant film, film group, Le Groupe Farid, formed in 1957 in part as a response to the films with which, with which the French colonial government and army blanketed the country from 1945 until Algerian independence in 1962. The group, which was led by the anti-colonialist French filmmaker René Vautier, created documentaries that screened in both Eastern and Western Europe and the Arab world. They depicted the life of FLN soldiers, fighters, and the atrocities of the French and made the case for independence. The political role of American and Egyptian commercial cinema and the potential its emotionally persuasive forms had for shaping public opinion was also widely recognized. Arab states themselves sought to use cinema as a political weapon, countering the ideological work of previous of prevailing commercial cinema. By the 1960s, members of the film industry were also well aware of the effects that market forces had on the content, quality, number, and variety of films that circulated in the region. Film then was recognized in these circles, not simply as a vehicle for the sustenance of local culture in modern form. It was also a tool for building solidarities, affectively shaping public opinion, as well as a weapon to be wielded in global ideological contestations. The familiarity Arab audiences had with, had with cinema culture was viewed with skepticism by many within the field. Audiences were understood to have developed faulty notions of what cinema was, a source of facile entertainment rather than of edification. Moreover, the commercial American and Egyptian films, what was sometimes described as opiate cinema, to which Arab audiences had been exposed, were seen as having distorted their values and dulled their political sensibilities by offering them false visions of the world or by lulling them into complacency through song, dance, and melodrama. While it is not surprising that radical filmmakers working within an explicitly political context would hold such views. In fact, this perspective was relatively mainstream in the Arab world by the late 1960s and early 1970s. Nonetheless, the existence of this culturally and politically suspect cinema culture also aided the development of alternative cinema. Filmmakers and their advocates could point to people's established viewing habits to argue for cinema as a powerful medium for shaping the worldview of its audiences and therefore a worthwhile endeavor. Public sector cinema was one way of combating the ills of commercial cinema in general and Hollywood in particular. The first such industry began in Egypt where Abdel Nasser's government instituted a number of measures, creating a fund for production, a national cinema organization, building a film school and cinemas and controlling the distribution of foreign films in the late 1950s, designed to encourage local film production and the development of new types of cinema. The apparatus of state-sponsored filmmaking began to be created in other parts of the Arab world in the 1960s. In Algeria, shortly after it, it, it achieved independence in 62, and in Iraq and Syria later during the decade. From the beginning, public sector cinema was conceived of as a tool for modernization and of strengthening national culture. Together, these developments would facil facilitate economic development and national independence. Towards these ends, public sector cinemas throughout the region sought to control the distribution of films in order to limit ideological influence and not the economic power of Hollywood and Egyptian commercial cinema, create an educated film viewing public through the active support of film clubs and cinema texts, training filmmakers either, either, either by funding their studying abroad or in the case of Egypt and eventually Iraq by creating film schools at home uh, and also Algeria for a brief period, and financing films that serve national interests and create relative rel and creating rel related national television industries. Public sector cinema never completely lived up to its promise. National control of film distribution did little to reduce the share of film screens devoted to Western uh, films in the region, and national film industries produced far fewer works than commercial industries could. In 
uh, the existence in Egypt of a well-entrenched commercial cinema industry populated with experienced filmmakers and performers with formidable star power made it difficult for a public sector industry to truly transform cinema production in Egypt. Algerian cinema stagnated as the industry remained largely fixated on films about the Algerian revolution well into the 1970s. Nonetheless, the public sector served as an important resource for quote, alternative filmmakers throughout the period. The Damascus gathering brought together filmmakers, critics, activists from across the region of varied backgrounds and inclinations. Some had graduated from programs for cinema, theory, theater, and adjacent fields of study at institutions of the Arab world. Many had studied abroad, most notably in Moscow and Paris, but also in Prague and the former, Yugos in the former Yugoslavia and Babelsberg in the GDR. Some had participated in the film collectives and movements that had begun to proliferate in the Arab world in the late 1960s. These included the Sigma Three Collective in Morocco that had produced the 1970 film, film Washma, Traces, directed by Hanin Banani, uh, and the Cinema Jadid movement in Algeria, which produced several provocative films addressing social, political, and cultural problems relating to poverty, rural life, and women in the early 1970s. The new cinema movement in Egypt, which produced two films, Song on the, Along the Passage and Shadows on the Other Side, as well as extensive writings on film, and the militant Palestine Film Unit, which had formed in Amman in 1968, um, and which was soon to institutionalize itself in the form of the Palestinian Cinema Institute in Beirut. The gathering also included film critics, many of whom like Sabir Farid from Egypt and Tashir, uh, Tahir Sharia from Tunis had helped to found or would soon found national and regional film festivals, cinema journals and associations for filmmakers and critics. Participants brought to the festival an acute awareness of the state of cinema in their home countries, a belief in the promise of cinema as the quintessential modern art form to help develop the region, secularism, political commitment, and optimism. At the gathering, they attempted to define what an alternative Arab cinema would encompass, both in terms of the types of films it should produce and its characteristics as a cultural movement. They identified a host of problems confronting Arab cinema and tried to initiate a plan of action for, for transforming it. Filmmakers differed on a number of issues. Some believed, for instance, that only documentary films could, follow the, could offer the authenticity and proximity to truth that the historical moment required. They had in mind not just the shocking lies of Arab leaders about the 1967 war that had humiliated people across the region, but also the 1970 betrayal of the Palestinian cause by uh, King Hossein during, the, during Black September in Jordan, which informed many of the Syrian works screened at the festival. Others understood authenticity differently or were more concerned with creating opportunities for freedom of expression and experimentation. In the symposia that accompanied the festival, young filmmakers attempted to define the changes to Arab cinema they hoped to bring about. The films produced within alternative Arab cinema would be diverse, accompanying both documentaries and fictional films of varying lengths, experimental works, as well as easily accessible narrative works. For the movement to succeed, at least some of its films would have to be attractive to wide audiences. Thus, these films would have to be formally simple or at least familiar, such that audiences could understand them. One participant noted that audiences do not come to the cinema to become exhausted or to be bored. Many attendees argued against experimental cinema, but the recently created Union of Arab Film Critics gave its award to Christian Ghazi's complex non-narrative feature film, A Hundred Faces for a Single Day, igniting a sense of debate. Films, participant argued, should be educational rather than merely entertaining. Most importantly, films needed to be honest and authentic. By this, they meant both that films should eschew the unrealistic fantasies of commercial cinema, melodramas and tales of improbable heroism, and narrowly nationalist films that mask the political and social problems confronting the Arab world. <clears throat> 
Filmmakers recognized that achieving these goals presented significant challenges. Film audiences would need to be trained to appreciate good cinema, which meant launching or enhancing educational programs, scene clubs, mobile cinemas, and the organization of, of film themed film weeks. They would need to pay attention, not just to the alternative content of films they made, but also to the material conditions of their making. Since commercial cinema would necessarily affect the ideology of any films it produced, and since public sector film industries were prone to similar pressures from the regimes under which they operated, alternative sources of funding needed to be developed. Co-productions and film collectives were suggested as means for addressing this problem. Participants also explored the possibilities of creating networks of support outside the film world itself, both among writers, artists, and musicians for creative support, as was the case with the short-lived Palestinian cinema group, and among potential other potential funders. Distribution was also recognized as a challenge to be addressed, partly by wresting control of Arab screens from commercial interests, and partly by cultivating audience taste, for films they would create. Uh, and many of these are actually uh, uh, activities and projects that individuals and small groups successfully uh, achieved in the ensuing decades. Where would an alternative Arab cinema situate itself within global developments in film? From their training abroad and readings that were beginning to appear in Arabic and French language publications in the Arab world, filmmakers were well aware of the various movements shaping global cinema of the period. They argued for using montage as a form of Marxist dialectic and studied the applicability of the ideas and practices of Italian neorealism, French New Wave, and direct cinema from the UK. Solana Sengettino's famous manifesto towards a third cinema appeared in the Moroccan journal Souffre in early 1970, at the same time that it first appeared in France. The 1973 issue of Al Marifa, dedicated to uh, the Damascus Film Festival, includes a critical engagement by Syrian filmmaker Nabil al Malik with the limits, of, the limits of cinema verite and the attempts at expressions of interiority by several European filmmakers, Antonioni, Alain René and Igmar Bergman. And that was just one of many, many similar um, articles engaging with European film and um, Soviet film theory to appear during this period in, in Arabic language periodicals. Participants were familiar with the cinemas of the many countries that organized film weeks dedicated to their national cinemas throughout the Arab world and the seminars and critical writings that accompanied such events. However, the young filmmakers in Damascus were not interested in applying these ideas to the Arab world, but rather in finding a specifically Arab cinematic language appropriate to their unique context. The Ma Damascus festival pr proved to be a high point for Syrian public sector cinema as embodied in the general cinema organization. Its director, Abdel Hamid Marri, was replaced shortly after the gathering and its new director, director adopted a narrower focus on Syria and its interests. The general cinema organization was also restructured economically in ways that significantly reduced the number of films it could produce. However, alternative Arab cinema continued, to, uh, continued elsewhere in the region. The following year, the first meeting of the Third World Cinema Committee took place in Algiers, a key step towards institutionalizing global networks of solidarity among filmmakers from the global south. In Lebanon, Maroun Baghdadi, who studied filmmaking in Paris, completed his prescient graduation film, Beirut au Beirut in 1974. Across the Mediterranean and Morocco, Years of work by filmmakers and their, support, their supporters who had come of age in the 1960s and early 70s began to bear fruit with works such as Suhail Ben Barka's A Thousand and One Hands, Mustafa Darkawi's About Some Meaningless Events, Mu'min Smihi's The East Wind, and Ahmed Al Ma'nawi's The Days, The Days. In Algeria, Merzak Al Alusha's Highly original Omar Gatlatu broke records for ticket sales in Algeria in 1976. By the middle of the decade, important Arab women filmmakers, including Salma Bakkar, Asya Jabbar, and Haini Sroor, also emerged, 
And these three would go on to publish a manifesto for Arab, Arab women's filmmaking. And eventually an Arab women's film festival um, was organized uh, in um, Constantine in uh, Algeria. A new renaissance of Egyptian realist cinema began in the 1980s, including directors such as Atif al Tayyib, Muhammad Khan, uh, and Khairi Bashara. Palestinian cinema, a key player in the militant wing of alternative Arab cinema, lost some of its early ex experimental exuberance in later years, but significantly in increased its capacity and level of professionalism. These disparate productions were connected through the work of writers and film activists, such as Tahar Sharia and, and Khamayas Khayati from Tunis, Nur al-Din Sayel from Morocco, Samir Farid from Egypt, Shafia Jaman, uh, Abdu Ashuba and Ali Akika from Algeria, and Saeed Murad, Omar Amir Alai, Muhammad Malas, and Salah Duhni from Syria, among many others who translated key texts of film history and theory into Arabic, wrote tirelessly about film in Arabic periodicals and founded and ran sin clubs, scene clubs, dedicated film journals and film festivals throughout the region. Through their work, Arab audiences kept abreast of developments across the region. Moscow and Paris emerged as important hubs for Arab cinema culture and Arab cinema began to develop critical audiences abroad. The path to developing an, indep uh, an independent cinema would never be easy, inextricably linked as it always was to the ever disappointing politics of the region, the path of alternative Arab cineasts was marked by defeats and disappointments. Writing from Moscow to Egyptian film critic Samir Farid during the 1982 Israeli invasion of Lebanon, Egyptian filmmaker Mohammed al Qalyubi eloquently expresses this sentiment. Isolated from work, Immersed in a state of deep inner despair and feelings of alienation, humiliation and distraction, trying to drown my worries by concentrating on work, writing a scenario for a comedy so bitter that it will, ha it will have no place on any screen in the world except on the screen of our generation, working, quote, to prevent myself from crying, a quote from Langston Hughes. It is perhaps within this feeling of the necessity of engaged filmmaking in the face of despair that the cin cinematic language of alternative Arab cinema can be found. Thank you. All right, thank you very much um, for that talk. And I'm going to let people start adding questions into the Q and A, um, the Q and A function of it. But I'm going to start off with a question of my own, which um, I'm not sure how, um, how far along in the research you are. So maybe. Maybe it'll be something to, to look for in the future because um, the discussion that you'd had today was mostly about the Damascus Film Festival, um, which is fascinating. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I'm really curious um, at this point in your research, have you noticed any differences between what were the discussions there and then the discussions over at um, Carthage at the JCC? And the reason I ask that is because, um, and then this is all my speculation from not knowing this history, so I, I could be completely wrong. But I know that JCC was very committed to being both um, pan-Arab and pan-African. Yes. And I don't know how much dialogue there is with the alternative, you know, the alternative year of Fespaco down in Wagadugu, which was pan-African. Yeah. Um, although I know the two films that, um, what's his name made? Kemarab, um Afrique. So I'm just curious, um, have you noticed any Sorry. Exactly, yeah. I'm curious if you've noticed any differences that um, in the different sites that you're looking at, because I know that you're looking at a whole range of sites. Were there things that sparked up or was it more actually pan-Arab at this moment? So it was kind of more by the time of what was the big issue at that particular year? Yeah, yeah. So the Carthage Film Festival is actually an amazing um, achievement. And uh, it was founded by Tahar Sharia, who was very active in the Damascus film festival and in this movement, if you can call it that, um, really uh, throughout um, his lifetime. Um, and uh, you know what, I need to go turn on the light 
in my apartment because it's it's getting dark. Just a sec, I'll be right back. Right ahead. And that, while she's doing really that, that will give everybody sorry. time to write questions. You won't miss anything. There. Okay. That was not very professional, but that that you know adds a, a nice uh, uh, relaxed atmosphere to the to the gathering and the discussion. <laughs> um, so Carthage began in 1966, and as you said, it was specifically a festival to um, for Arab and African cinema. And uh, it's interesting. Now, in 66, though, it also looked across the Mediterranean to Europe and the found the early documents um, founding it. it um, and so it welcomed the global north, um, you know, since they, you know, as part of the Mediterranean, but, um, but they, um, uh, but they were very sensitive to the global north not dominating uh, that this be a festival for Arab and African cinema and the global north would be sort of on the margins. Um, so this is a quite a different sentiment from what you it's it's more of a post-colonial view than and then this the anti-colonial view, a more militant view that you see in 1972 in Damascus. Um, but um, if you look at the documents of Carthage, and I've, I've looked at them to some extent, uh, but um, there's a great dissertation that, uh, um, that was written in French about this that, that includes a lot of the documents. Um, uh, the, the Carthage, Carthage really uh, evolves with the, with the times. Um, so the 1972 Carthage Film Festival is very militant. Uh, and then it becomes kind of glitzy um, in the late 70s. And then it becomes a little less glitzy and more um, real, shall we say, down to earth um, in the 80s. Um, so uh, so it's, 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 very, it's, it's really interesting. It's something I'm, I'm looking forward to, to delving into. And your question about, um, you know, this, this focus on the Arab world as opposed to um, Arab in Africa that is very much a part of Carthage. And by the way, when the Damascus Film Festival is founded in 1979, it's, it's, it's set so that it, the Carthage Film Festival is a biennial film festival. And so was the Damascus Film Festival that began in 1979. And so they, they they operated on off years, alternate years, so they wouldn't conflict. And the Damascus one was supposed to be um, the Arab world in Asia. It never really succeeded quite as well as Carthage did in, in embracing, yeah, I mean, Asia is so, is so huge and has, you know, I mean, India alone could dwarf everybody. Um, but, uh, um, but it raises an interesting, and I think uh, interesting, point about um, the concept of Arab cinema um, that is part of what complicates things, I think, for filmmakers, which is precisely the fact that um, as manifested in Carthage, but many other activities in particularly the Maghreb part of North Africa, a real strong sense of being a part of Africa, as well as being part of the Arab world, as well as being post-colonial and in relation with France in ways that cannot be utterly severed, um, that is very different from the Mushrik. Um, and so that there's, there's a tension there that, that and you can see um, there's, there's sort of a division where you know, there's a lot of work being done by many of the people I mentioned and others to bridge uh, you know, the Mashriq and the Maghrib, the Eastern part of the Arab world and the Western part of the Arab world. You see in the you know, Moroccan film journals, you've got you know, articles on Syrian cinema and um, you know, Egyptian cinema. And similarly in Syria, you've got things on Algeria and Morocco. Um, but um, 
but it is, but it's quite clear that there are, there are some differences. Uh, another major difference is the centrality of Palestine to the Mashriq, um, which, which is evident not just in the Syrian public sector cinema, but, but in the ways, I mean, the, 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 you know, all the disappointments relating to Palestine, it's clear they had a much uh, bigger effect on filmmakers from Egypt and then further west, to further east. To, to the West, you had a lot of support for Palestine and you have a lot of articles about Palestinian cinema and you know, an issue of the um, Moroccan journal Souf that is dedicated to the Palestinian cause. I think that's in 1969 or 1970. There's a lot of interest, but it's not felt, that's the feeling I get, the sense I get. It's not felt as this kind of the wound that it is um, in the Arab mashrik. And that, that has um, a significant effect um, on Arab cinema. So, so there's this fissure. And so Arab cinema, if you think about Arab cinema in relation to other you know, third world cinemas, um, you know, it, it, there, there are these, these fissures um, uh, that are um, significant. Um, and then, of course, later we'll have the, you know, the, the looking to the, across the Indian Ocean that, that in this part of the world, you know, the Gulf that, that didn't really exist at that time. Uh, I mean, there, there wasn't really, there were hardly even any countries, <laughs> um, let alone, you know, cinema cultures, you know. Uh, that, that's interesting. I wonder, I I wonder yeah. if the one of the more dominant um, cleavages in a kind of an Arab identity, a pan-Arab identity, is the effects of French colonialism and British colonialism, um, in the sense that the countries in the Maghreb um, were, they had Algeria as kind of the, the local um, anti-colonial struggle, which was successful, um, which comes with its own problems, as you mentioned, in terms of the infrastructure the French did, the way that they would train people to make films, versus the British system where, um, you know, colonial subjects were not allowed to make the films at all. Um, but the revolution is not complete. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, so, uh, and the British, as far as I can tell, just were not interested in, in developing cinema culture at all. So, um, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, it's part of their censorship. I mean, I know that more from the Indian context because they yeah. were a bigger presence there. But yeah, they just censored all films so as to not allow film culture. Although in India, ironically, you know, they had a big one. Um, but I'm curious. Um, you mentioned that some of the debates that they were having in the 1974 or two, the the first example you gave, the the first festival, 72. This, the um, Damascus festival they were in 72. To, yeah, yeah, 72. So they were trying to think about, um, and this hints back to my first question. They were trying to think about how do we make films borrowing from different strategies that we can find. So a lot were being trained in the Soviet system, the French system, et cetera. But then how do we make them Arab? Like, you know, the, I, I'm sorry, you're breaking up. Mess and however they're defining it. Um, that was, I mean, that's the thing that I find really interesting. Oh, sorry, am I back? You, you broke up, so if you could repeat the question. Uh, yeah. um, so I was just curious, um, at that festival, when they were discussing ways to make, um, to bring like an Arabness to the filmmaking, um, have you gotten into any of the documents to find out what it is that they were choosing that was kind of Arabness that wasn't Egyptian cinema and wasn't duplicating foreign yeah. models and... So, um, so they. Do, so I haven't found documents where they actually specify this is an Arab cinematic language. <laughs> so they talk about they talk about issues of realism and, you know, I mean, there's a lot of talk about. You know, okay, how are we going to be real? <laughs> I mean, that we need to be. It, this needs to be. We need a cinema that's really closely tied to our the, our lived experience. Um, it's, it's just too, what's going on right now is too important to, to ignore. Um, so, and then there's, there's a, a lot of um, translation 
you know, their letter of translating film theory uh, from Europe and, and the Soviet Union, um, and then engaging with that and writing about that, that film theory. Um, but I think you can see in the films themselves, and they change over time, obviously, and I haven't watched all of them because I won't, I'll never be able to watch all of them. They're not available and they're too many, but I've seen, you know, in, in the, the viewing that I've done, what I see is you have, for instance, in this early period, a kind of, um, a, a lot of films um, where there's a real focus on observation. So there's stories that are really excuses to go out and get to know what is this place that is supposedly my country? What is Morocco? Um, you know, let's make a, let's have a road, road movie that starts at the south and ends at the north and meets people all over the way. <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, what is, you know, how, what is village life really like? What is, you know, so, so you've got, there, there are documentaries, but you've got fiction films where there's, and, 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 uh, or, or, or films about the Arab city, where you can see that there's sort of like, what is the city that I'm living in? What are the, what are the, you know, how do different architectures cohabit? And, and who are the people among whom I am living? Um, and then um, one interesting development, I think, is um, a sort of reevaluation of Egyptian cinema over the course of this period and a reconsideration of, in particular, of the of, of melodrama, um, and whether whether there is a place for melodrama in serious Arab, you know, alternative Arab cinema, and um, this uh, the um, person I mentioned at the end of my talk, Kalyubi, for instance, um, he makes a kind of a new melo, you know, neo melodrama. <laughs> um, where he, you know, uh, which I haven't seen that film yet, um, uh, but uh, um, that is, um, and, and it's received controversially, uh, where, you know, some, some people like it and others say, oh no, this is melodrama, melodrama is bad. But, but um, uh, so, and, and there, I mean, there's so many different things going on uh, in different places, but I think, but what I meant at the end by the cinematic language being defined by this tenacity under which there is a kind of optimism. Like you have to believe that there's a reason to act in order to like spend all this time and energy acting. So there's that um, and dedication, but also despair and, um, and constraint um, that, that in, in looking at the films themselves, those two things you have to keep in mind. You know, whether, you know, regardless of camera angles or, um, uh, you know, use of light or, you know, mon you know, different editing techniques and so on, keeping those two things in mind as framing every single project that comes out of this time, um, I think will, is, is a productive way of recognizing what's really, you know, what is going on, what is achieved um, uh, by these uh, film, filmmakers and what I call the film activists, the ones who didn't make film but, but were dedicated to film. Made films, yeah, by writing about them. I'm curious if you see that film. I'm really curious to hear about that because that's a, a debate actually in Bengali cinema as well with Rithik Gothic using melodrama. Um, and such at racing, you know, let's use realist and Gothic's bringing in um, Bresh, so it's got the alienation effects and everything. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. These common things. Um, I, there's a question from the audience, but I want to ask yeah. one thing. Have you ever seen this film by Halifa Shaheen called Fun Throughout Lebanon? No, I haven't. Bahrain, 1971. I'd, I've read it, you know, I've only read the title, um, so I've never seen it. But it made me think when you gave the example of a Moroccan film going around Morocco to kind of you know, see Morocco in all its um, diversity, if maybe that's what this film is about. Um, 
and I don't remember if it's a documentary or a fiction film. Um, and I don't even, I, anybody okay. knows where it is, yeah. please share it with us because I think we'd all like to see it. Um, but we have a question. Um, this is an interesting one that, um, um, what would you say contributed to the demise of this movement? And why haven't we seen such an occurrence again? Uh, well, I would say that it didn't, it, there isn't a demise. It's continued now. Um, so, I mean, the material conditions of filmmaking changed um, in that you have uh, um, uh, with, with the 1990s, you know, you have, well, beginning earlier, actually, beginning in the 80s, but really it, it increases uh, in the 90s with these other, other funding models. So European funding of, um, uh, uh, you know, European film funds that fund, you know, Arab film production and, uh, um, and, and I think that, and, uh, you know, uh, Hamid Dabashi writes about that in Accented Cinema, right? That, you know, a particular type of film emerges from that, which is, is not, you know, it's not divorced from the Arab world, um, but it is, it is very aware of its European audiences uh, in ways that this earlier cinema was not. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so that's a major change, um, and um, and then of course you 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 and we have the film funds from the Gulf, uh, from a, a somewhat later period. Um, so so things change uh, in the in the later period, but but it, um, uh, but I think that there. Um, uh, and then, of course, the technological changes with the rise of, of digital technology and, uh, you know, so now everybody can make films, right? Anybody with a cell phone can make a film. And you've got thousands and thousands of those films being made. <laughs> um, uh, and some of them are very interesting. Uh, so, so, uh, so things change significantly, but I don't think this, this idea uh, um, ever dies away completely. And part of the way that you see it manifested today is in the work that a lot of uh, younger generations are doing around the Arab world to excavate, to preserve this work, to screen it again. Um, uh, things like the, you know, NAS network of Arab cinemas or Arab screens um, is an example. And then there, you know, there are many projects in you know various national contexts um, that um, uh, that I would say are um, uh, uh, are a continuation in many ways of this this film work. Sorry, I'm muting because I'm also having a little bit of Zoom interference with a small cat. <laughs> um, singing, singing below me. Um, that's interesting. And this is these, these constant debates that uh, um, I was thinking, I'm going back a little bit in your talk about how to reach audiences. So there was that militant, and you mentioned that the Towards the Third Cinema had been translated into Arabic at the same time as French, and that was yes. like to decolonize the mind. So it's to reinvent film, um, which you know worked with some audiences, but not with all of them, because a lot of them did want some sort of entertainment. So it's interesting. these these debates that come through and how they're yeah. trying to figure that out. Um, I want to point out um, Ali Yunus commented that it is a documentary. Fun in Lebanon is a documentary. So thank you for uh, that one. And we have um, a couple more questions. The first one is, um, are there arch archival resources on this material? Um, I think that means both films and also the, the paper of Demera. The archival resources. Well, the internet is a wonderful thing. <laughs> Um, and, and um, you know, the, the work I just mentioned, you know, all the work that, that various people around the region are doing to archive their, you know, this material, find, find material, put it in one place, has been very useful to me. Um, but, uh, um, uh, and then a lot of, I've spent a lot of time looking for various periodicals. And 
you know, the Institut du Monde Arabe in Paris um, has a lot of film journals. Um, uh, many of the, the that slide I, that I showed uh, with film journals, the covers of film journals, um, they have good runs, um, at least from the later period um, of those journals. Um, and, uh, and then um, there are other um, archives. I mean, at, frankly, Google Books is a great source. If you type in Arabic, you know, names, um, you know, you'll get these little snippets that will say, oh, because all these Arabic periodicals have been um, digitized by Google Books. And so you can type in the, a name like Nabil, Nabil al-Malih in Arabic, and you know, you'll get these little snippets and it will say it's this, you know, the 1986, some issue in 1986 of this cultural journal, there's some article where his name is mentioned, connected with cinema. And so then, you know, you can go to that, you know, and then find the specific issue that it's in. Um, there are uh, the, uh, the National Library of Morocco has digitized a number of journals, so that's very helpful. Um, uh, and then, yeah, I mean, it's there's, and I mean, interlibrary loan is another amazing thing. So um, a lot of these film journals are available in various um, uh, libraries uh, around the world, and uh, one can request, you know, tables of contents and then, you know, the articles that one needs. And, um, uh, and I, I am hoping as well to eventually travel <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, I, I know the Cinematheque in Algiers um, has been in operations, uh, you know, it's, I mean, they, I guess they, 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 have a, they have a great archive is what I've heard. I, I have no idea how broad it is and whether it's, it's, a, it's focusing mainly on Algeria or whether it's got a lot more from other parts of the Arab world or, or other parts of the world for that matter. But um, um, I'm, I'm hoping that, that I might be able to go there and do research there, but uh, but it's it's this is a mammoth project and it's it's going to take a lot of legwork <laughs> and eye work. That's fantastic. I didn't know that these journals were all scanned by Google Books, or at least some of them are scanned by Google Books, so are available. Um, we have one final question because we're at the end of our time. By um, Samira Kasim, who I think you know. Yeah? Yes. Yes, okay. She gave her name. Um, is there any um, Arab film theorist um, from this period that you would recommend and who would it be? So um, let me get back to you on that, Samira, because, <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I have this huge mass of articles and I haven't yet, I, I mentioned the, the article by Nabil Maleh, and I believe he's um, written other things, and that's that's a really insightful article. Uh, so there's one, uh, but um, uh, but I have a mass of articles um, that I haven't yet read about all this film theory. That um, and you know I just have to wade through it all to see who is just saying yet again what is the kino eye, and you know and who is actually um, saying make insightful comments. Um, about, you know, how this might be applied in the Arab world and so on. But um, uh, so there's, I mean, there's a, there's a huge amount of writing um, from this period and today actually um, about cinema in the Arab world. And it's a real mixed bag and it can be difficult to figure out what, what is worth spending time on. So I'll get back to you on that. This is a plug for the eventual book that will come out <laughs> to be continued. Um, that's fantastic news so that you're finding so much material to look through and then be able to sort through because um, that's really good news because I mean that certainly um, is a gap if you look at any kind of like intro to film theory yeah. book. There's like nothing from the Arab world. Um, films, yes, but nothing of the theory. So it's, you know, I guess it hasn't been translated into yeah. languages that people writing those books can read. So this will be a fantastic contribution 
Um, because thank you very much for sharing this research with us in progress. Um, we're looking forward to um, seeing articles and conference presentations and eventually the book that will come out from it and whatever else, because maybe you'll be inspired to make a film or a digital archive or something else as people do when they find so much material they can't they can't even read it all themselves. So they're like, here it is for all of us. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Um, we're getting thank yous in the, the comments. Um, a lot of familiar faces that we don't get to see, but we get to read your name. So that's at least a, a type of presence. <laughs>